YouTube unless I give you a link and I unhide it, so um, I will do that. Oh, okay. How are you guys doing? Good. Good. Ready to I'm chat up some buff we're not so far away. There now? Yeah, ready, ready. Um, so you're going to edit this to make us look smart, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So don't, I mean... It's, and, it's thin. Like, and thin also. <laughs> you already got that down. And I don't think there's any amount of editing that's going to get rid of it. <laughs> no, no editing is going to help there. <laughs> so, um, well, like I said, to get, to get started, I mean, before we really jump into these, into these pieces, um, I thought it would be helpful for you guys just to sort of give a little indication of um, you know, the topic that, that I sort of gave you guys, tasked you guys with, is what I just called ethical Derrida, which sort of came to mean, and we're, we're going to problematize this a little bit, I think, during the course of the conversation, but came to mean sort of Levinas, Levinasian Derrida, Derrida as he takes up Levinas. Um, obviously, there's a lot of different sources, I and mean, there's a lot of places in Derrida where it really explicitly takes up Levinas, and there's a lot of interviews where Levinas explicitly responds to Derrida. And so, um, but I was wondering if, in general, you could tell me your sense of what you think the importance of ethical Derrida is, uh, um, you, know, you can say philosophically, but also specifically to the field of rhetoric. I mean, for instance, Brad, you posed one of these questions, like the word rhetoric doesn't appear in anything that we're reading right now, and um, to, to what extent is that a problem, or is it a difficulty, is it an inadequacy in, in, in the field, or, you know, so I'm wondering if you guys could just sort of start off by talking for a little bit about what role ethical Derrida has played in your intellectual life? Sure. You go ahead, Brooke. You, yeah, you people, want me to go? Deeply immersed in this. Okay. Um, well, I mean, I think, I mean, in the most basic sense, and I, I want to keep it basic because I think in it, some important ways it is separate from the Levinas question, I think that Derrida's ethics involves the kind of ongoing interruption of being by otherness. Like, and, and so for me it's like the ongoing that's important. Um, and so I feel like what, what deconstruction is about is um, responding to something that unsettles identity. It lets itself be at stake. Um, it try, even though you can't define the other, even though the other is beyond calculation, Derrida's really good at showing why it's important to seek it out, to try to respond to it, to let yourself be transformed by it. Um, so for me, that's meant um, undertaking that practice in kind of specific and, and traditionally rhetorical locations and help me rethink those locations and... Um, change the traditionalness of them. I think also, in a way, and even in this piece that's that's so religious, there, there's just a way that rhetoric itself is so other-oriented, even if not initially in that otherness is the ongoing interruption of being, um, that it, it fits well, right? Like the field was born in a way to figure out how to respond to others, how to interact with um, something else, an audience. Um, and so, I don't know, it seems like a natural fit. Not to mention the fact that Derrida himself is often interested in questions that I would consider rhetorical questions, having to do with memory, having to do with rhetorical forms. Um, so, I mean, he's an incredibly important and versatile thinker, I think, for the field. Let, let me, b before uh, I, I give you a chance, Brad, let me just jump in on, on that. I mean, so for instance, like, if we're confined and not thinking in terms of Derrida specifically, but thinking in terms of Levinas in this case, like, you know, for Levinas, rhetoric's the problem, right? Mm -hmm. Rhetoric is uh, because it is not a forthright uh, uh, and sincere uh, address in a face to face interaction. Um, and so, I mean, he doesn't, I don't think he anywhere has anything nice to say about rhetoric specifically. And so, so it's interesting, you know, for you. I mean, and I take that point, it's for you that rhetoric is entirely organized about attending to others, but for him, it's entirely organized about not attending to others insofar as it's concerned with persuasion, uh, you know, influence, seduction, all of, the, all of those negative attributes. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think um, what's good about Derrida and, and rethinking some of those classical rhetorical scenes is that he shows the way that 
it can also be other oriented in in that theoretically sophisticated way. There's a way that persuasion doesn't get off the ground until it is um, responding to what it's faced with. So involved in otherness in a way that, or predisposed in a way from the beginning. That's not that's not always the case. I mean, I think I mean it, you know I think Levinas is um, though he doesn't say much about it. His his typical discussions about it just show that he hasn't, you know, it just wasn't an, a particular area of interest for him. He had one very kind of narrow um, thinking of what that meant, right? I mean... Yeah, I think so, and I also think that, you know, yeah. there's, a, there's a change that occurs. I mean, totality infinity is all about a kind of peaceful relationship to the other. Uh -huh. um, and then otherwise than being, ten years later, has much, you know, the language of substitution and the hostage, and so, you know, the, the issue, I think, of, and, you know, the way that I tell the story, of course, is uh, Levinas wrote Totality Infinity, and then Derrida wrote um, Violence and Metaphysics in response to it, in which he effectively says, look, you don't get to have that peaceful thing without violence, uh -huh. and Levinas took that criticism to heart, and so that, that later Levinas and the sort of necessity of violence may not be as opposed uh, um, to rhetoric as, as the earlier more peace, understanding of a peaceful uh, um, relationship with the other might be. So, But I mean, we can return to some of these questions of, of violence and et, et cetera if we'd like, but Brad, I want to give you a chance to um, talk about why you think ethical Derrida matters to... Sure. Sort of um, well, the, the ground of the response is sort of in personal background uh, academically in the sense of just by nature or whatever. Um, Derrida is one of sort of the three theoretical uh, mentors for me in terms of practice and thinking about practices. And this is uh, in, in conjunction with somebody like Foucault or Deleuze. And um, that's my word. But as a conversation point, I think they all have a sense of uh, rigorous attention to practice, to, um, in this case, notions of forgiveness, uh, even love, as well as hospitality. So to read those as practices is to look at them and ground it in particular intersubjective relationships, which are political, ethical, uh, as well as ontological by nature. And this is one of the kind of interesting binds I think you get into as somebody who self-identifies as doing rhetorical theory. It, uh, I'm I pose the question, I know, sort of where's rhetoric in here, which is customary. It's a necessary question, but it's one I'm sort of tired of, and I wish I had a be better version of the question. Because um, the question always sort of gets me hitting back on the beachhead of the fact that I'm somebody doing rhetorical theory by um, reading someone who's not trying to do theory in any sense, in sort of the conventional sense. This is a deconstruction as a material intervention in a set of practices, uh, textual practices and uh, lineages of, of language and so forth. Um, so for me, it's it's sort of to inhabit that aporia as the productive uh, mode and to find ethics there. And so he provides a model in a sense of how an attention to the textual practice or the speech act or however one would want to translate it here is uh, part and parcel of an attention to a certain kind of ethics, that they're simultaneously enacted. And it seems to me in a lot of, at least historically speaking, rhetorical theory, you do the work of rhetoric and then you do the work of, theoretical work of rhetoric, and then you do the practical politics or ethics or whatever it might be. And so the synthesis here is what's valuable for, for me. Um, in taking a part, he produces something new. And I'd like to try and actually emulate that more and more. That's something I've thought about by way of him and sort of some of the other people who are um, real touchstones for me is how do you um, produce something new through the work of something like critique or deconstruction or interpretation even. So. I think that's great, and I mean, I, I you know, I, I would want to uh, uh, piggyback on that if I were responding to this question by saying, like, I feel like I learned how to to read well from Derrida, um, yeah. which is to say, his uh, analyses um, are performances of an engagement with other thinkers and other works. They are not simply arguments in response to them, such that the how of the interaction, like how the uh, the writing and thinking proceeds is um, something that Derrida, and I think more than most philosophers, and frankly, 
almost all academics, that taking the form of the interaction of the questioning as really important to, uh, you know, to how that questioning proceeds. I mean, I, you get this from Heidegger as well, right? The, the, how do you ask the question, question of being? But, uh, and so it, it's not an either or, but I definitely, for me, Derrida's was an idiom where it's like a kind of the careful attention. I mean, so much of w what we read in the hospitality essay, I don't know well because I don't know the the um, the figures that he's talking about in, in this Arabo-Christian uh, um, right. tr tradition. Um, but nevertheless, I just get this sense that he's moving around in um, um, interesting ways and paying attention being generous at moments, uh, you know, the question of whether or not this is a conversion narrative, well, yeah, it is, but not really, and so, like, attempting to be, to, to offer a, a kind of a generosity in the ways that he thinks with the other thinkers that he's engaging, so. Yeah, can I piggyback real quick as a coda to what I said earlier, is that it seems to me like Derrida is one of the great test cases for how you can do uh, rhetoric in the way that a lot of, um, rhetorical theorists engaged in continental theory want to do it, which is without sort of saying, here's rhetoric and there's rhetoric. Yeah. Um, and in that sense, what I mean by a model, it, I'm thinking out loud now and kind of interpreting myself, is to say he provides a model of how to do that without categorizing what rhetoric is. There's a way, there's a global sense in which he's doing it and we don't need to draw attention to it by a particular definition because the goods of it are not in the drawing of attention to a disciplinary terminology, it's into breaking down the concept and rebuilding it. So. Right, I mean, it fits well into the discussion, which is uh, once the other is recognized as other, it costs you something in terms of one's capacity for hospitality and generosity. And if you substitute the word other, if you substitute the word rhetoric for other, like the, the desire to see the rhetoric in it, uh, it, I mean, it returns to some of the dynamics that we're going to be talking about. Yeah. yeah. I, I think that the um, one of the things that I always like about reading Derrida is the way that he seems to demonstrate an explicit attention to, and I'm sorry if I'm going to do the thing we just talked about, it's good not to do. But, no, no, it's not a prohibition. <laughs> but, you know, he's interested in, um, you know, producing a signifying effects, which, I mean, you know, as uh, John, you argue in your book, like, this is what rhetoric is interested in doing. And there's a way that he kind of takes up that um, mission without talking about it, but but it is a it is the production of effects yeah. that, that extends beyond the content of what's under analysis. Absolutely. So it strikes me as, like, ideal for... Um, those of us who have interest in rhetoric, because it's a certain kind of attunement to um, analysis that's productive, right? That's not simply mimetic. Mm -hmm. Well, let me let me jump in. Let's let's jump into the uh, um, to the essays. I mean, I'm inclined to s start with the Der Derrida. I mean, we can the the Levinas to me is interesting insofar as it. it you know, it clarifies certain moments of his thinking, and and really his relationship with Heidegger to me, uh, and Husserl. I found I found some of those things interesting in terms of how right. he saw himself as 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 differing. Um, and then there's a couple moments in there about Derrida, you know. Um, but the the hospitality essay to me, or the ho hospitality, sorry, uh, ho hospitality, hospitality um, uh, series of lectures, right? I mean, that's yeah. I guess their lecture notes. Um, are interesting. I mean, there's a light motif that returns here to me for Derrida that I, uh, I I texted Brooke the other night when I was reading this, and and um, that that I, I kind of maybe I've just been reading Derrida too long, but I, I, I find a little um, I'm not sure I, I I don't find it as compelling as I used to, and that's this, which is. The conditions of possibility are simultaneously the conditions of impossibility of any particular practice, um, and I, I'm, I'm wondering if, like, so this is a, I mean, this is a real question that I'm struggling with. Is that, um, is does that say anything, uh, or I mean, what, what, no. I don't want to ask it that way. Like, what work does it do to demonstrate? And that's what he does here with hospitality. He does this with forgiveness and in different ways, right? And, and we're going to talk about the specific differences, and, and I don't want to align to those things. But as a, as a recurring leitmotif, the demonstration of 
simultaneity of conditions of possibility and impossibility. I mean, what does that what does that do in, in, for you guys? I think it doesn't let you settle on a comfortable um, sense of a concept, right? Like it, it always keeps you on the move, a kind of, um, I don't know, nomadic structure of thought that, that doesn't, you know, if you never get to settle on, um, you know, a pure moment of welcome or, uh, uh, you know, if, if if for you know forgiveness, you know, must involve the unforgivable. There's a way that you're never off the hook, right? It's you're always in the midst of that, never fully satisfied, but always necessary negotiation. Um, and so, in that way, it's I think central to the ethical project of Derrida. But when you do, especially in these lectures, when you see the analysis, the same kind of analysis across these different concepts, it does ask you to wonder, like, okay, what is the I mean, what is it called? The the analogical um, relationship between all of those different concepts. Um, there is a way to, to to see that structure repeating itself, but in these different forms. Yeah, John, I had a, a similar um, I don't know kind of reflex as you, I think, um, in the sense where I, I mean, I just the word difference kept flashing. <laughs> In my brain. And like this is this is structurally or methodologically a reading of difference, uh, except it's articulated in a different form or mode of textuality or however you want to describe it. And so I I hadn't kind of considered it in these specific terms until you asked the question, but it might be interesting, and I'm not I'm not expert enough in different versions of deconstruction to deconstructionism to ask, but it seems like when he makes the ethical move that we get, uh, so I'm going to give a kind of pro and con thing, so we, the, in terms of the con, we do get a sort of refrain that he uses over and over again, and it'd be interesting to see if for him, uh, if deconstruction becomes something, man, I don't want to say predictable, I don't want to rest with that, but we, we can kind of follow it as uh, a set of refrains that he goes through and runs it through different kinds of analytic circumstances. And so I'm just interested in the question of what else deconstruction could be. And if there's people who would know better, if, if um, I'm trying to think back to the later works, I, I think he gets much more explicitly involved in certain sorts of obviously, more conspicuously ethical terrain. And so if if almost deconstruction as a question is a little bit more displaced. I mean, he's referring to it here, but as a, as a method, if it um, if it remains a relatively similar set of moves. But the pro of it is, of course, is that in a certain way, um, apropos of the notion of otherness, is that a familiar concept. Time, and I'm always struck by how hospitality and forgiveness is not what I thought it was. Yeah. At, yeah. All, at the end of this reading. And so it's not as if to say that even if the refrain gets a little bit predictable, and again, I don't like that word. That's just for conversation. Um, I can kind of follow and know where it's going, and I do get to new places still. I mean, I think that's genuinely um, evident. So, yeah. because, and I think that you're uh, the 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 positive valence that I would give to that to, for me is that. If you just take the claim, the conditions of possibility are simultaneously the conditions of impossibility, as a as a content claim, that's that's kind of uninteresting. But what he insists on is precisely that that must always be negotiated, like that must always be undergone. That 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 uh, um, seeming paradox has to be you know exposed in, in some way, and and that's the crucial part. So that and not just in a theoretical thinking of hospitality. But in actual hospitality, right? Like, I mean, the the question of, for instance, things like the invitation. I never thought of these things before, right? The 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 cost uh, of of the invitation. Um, and I guess at one level, then I, I another way of framing that question for me is 
uh, and Brooke does it really well in the chapter, the Lysias chapter. So there's a distinction here yeah. between um, what what we're calling like um, absolute hospitality, or or he calls at one point radical hospitality, and then something like uh, the domain of the political or the domain. That's what Levinas uses in terms of ethics and politics, right? Um, in, in terms of the like the actual hospitality, and it's and it's thinking the relations among those that becomes. I mean, necessary and crucial. You know. Yeah. Um, can I pose with, I mean, the idea of the conditions of possibility for forgiveness or love or hospitality being there. Impossibility. Uh, are, um, I know Derrida doesn't want to do this, but, I mean, um, it's interesting to think how, if, if that's a point of negation or um, a prohibition or whatnot, but it also has positive content. It's the weird kind of moment I always get to with Derrida. If being barred from, if the impossibility is a possibility, if, if there's a something that bars me from being able to forgive, if that's not the operative condition of forgiveness, how is he turning a, a negative into a positive absence into presence and so forth, or is, is the paradox the point? Is, this is the breakdown I always get to. Mm -hmm. I mean, I feel like, I mean, I, I, I think I would definitely settle on the latter, um, that the paradox is the point. But what I also liked about rereading this, there is a way, actually, that um, that structure, that the condition of possibility is also the condition that makes it impossible, there is a way that he actually takes from the content of the concept, right, uh, hospitality, right, in the opening of this when he, he, he relates it to the smile and the laugh. Yeah. So there is a way that he's actually taking um, the, the, the structure from which he'll explore this concept has to contend with specifics from that concept, right, like you know, to be the thing that it is, it has to, um, it has to involve a smile in some sense. Like, so, so like that's a specific um, way that it's informed by the thing that it's taking up. Um, so, I don't know, I do notice the ways that, even though it always does in, in this kind of apparatic moment, it nonetheless at least resides for a moment in the realm it's exploring. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it gets, it takes as its definitional base, I mean, essential uh, essential elements of the concept. So uh, it seems to me that, yeah. it seems to me that it's, um, you know, importantly linked to the thing it takes up and not simply running the same mantra the same way across different things. You're right, and I, I actually think, you know, at least for me, I mean, as I return to it, there's this, I wouldn't want to call it a paradox, because paradox implies simply a logical relation. You that's know, right. You know, in terms of thinking of it as a contradiction, and that's why I think aporia is a little bit better of a, a concept, there, unless we did some work on them, but, but it is, I mean, it is about the moment of encounter of irreconcilable demands that are uh, absolute um, uh, demands and it's it's not a logical problem you know it's it's a pragmatic uh, uh, problem and that's that's the thing because it, in some ways what's what what I'm responding to is having read it a lot it's starting to sound like a logic like a logical problem, like a, a proposition or a content, um, which is interesting in and of itself, right? I mean, there's certain pragmatic uh, habituations or refrains um, s cease sounding musical at some point and, and become, you know, it would be like, it's it's like Elvis Costello's relation to the song Allison. Like, it's probably not even a song for him anymore. Right. right? <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. He does have, I mean, he does, there is a little bit of that analytic philosopher bone in him, and there's, there's an argument here, which always drives me nuts. This is a little bit of a tangent, but, I mean, this is systematic argumentation uh, it, by its own definition, which is actually something I admire here. It's, it's not just playing with language, and I agree with you. It's the kind of, I would call it a pragmatic problem or, or a kind of performative, not problem, but issue mm -hmm. or recognition that the... The language that people use to do these things 
doesn't do what they think it's doing. It does something more and something less as well. Um, but we still do it anyway with that very language. Um, what do you, well, what do you, let's get into it a little bit. What do you see as the uh, argument or, 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 or some, of the, some of the argument? For me, the, for me, the buy-in with uh, forgiveness, because I'm immersed with that right now. So I'll just say two quick things about that. Uh, Brooke's probably much more better prepared than I am to say deeper th thoughts on it. But, I mean, in terms of forgiveness, the, for a long time, just as a speech act, the idea of forgiveness has preoccupied me, that when one says, I forgive, what does one actually do? And this is real-life stuff. Um, you know, the, sh the horrific shooting in Charleston very recently. The woman gets up in um, court and says, I forgive you. Um, so it's a powerful statement, but it's also a question of what exactly does that do in the world? And when one does that, the language is speaking for the person as much as the person is speaking it. Um, or after, you know, um, uh, a long drawn out civil war of horrific violence when people say as an act of state they forgive one another tied to amnesty and so forth. What does forgiveness actually mean? So this is very controversial and it's a, a, a one that um, controversy that spans far and wide from Derrida but um, so the, the performative aspects of the language that I'm, I'm interested in the ways in which impossibility here can be turned productive. Um, in exactly those scenes and situations. So I, I read the argument as being one of, from an ethical standpoint, the second thing I'll say then is, is how the impossibility of forgiveness can nevertheless drive on the work of forgiveness. Um, perhaps, in an, this is a not a term Derrida would use, but in a more informed or enlightened way, or at least kind of critically aware way. So that's my initial, that was my strongest of several kind of strong connection points here, but that was definitely the thing that preoccupied me the most. I think um, for me the the hospitality is useful in that it works in a similar way, right? Like it's definitely, um, I mean, so I mean, just right now, so real life, so so pertinent to, um, you know, how, how what it what it means for us to, I mean. How, do, how does one welcome an outsider inside? And I mean, it, it seems so necessary, so so pressing right now to be a little more, um, uh, I mean, just to be a little more open to the fact that, you know, you, you're you not as, as, as self-sufficient and sovereign as you think you are. Your borders aren't as, um, as, as solid and firm and productive as, as you wish they might be and, and that your anxiety about protecting them um, you know really speaks to the more important point which is that you know you don't have the you don't have the auton the kind of free um, freely presenting yourself to the world autonomy to uh, draw this line between outside and inside self and other and so these these protective um, insular, Rhetorics that we see so often, um, you know, in the in a president in a Republican presidential debate. Um, I mean, I feel like reading reading the the distinction between absolute hospitality and conditional hospitality or hospitality by right. I mean, what thinking about absolute hospitality can show us is that look, this is this hospitality by right, conditional hospitality. It's futile. It's anxious. It's protesting too much and. Um, and perhaps it is possible to conditionally welcome in a way that's not, um, you know, not a, an inquisition, not, um, not on the side of, of, of keep everyone out. Um, so Which I, is, I mean, that, when we were talking the other day, I don't have anything terribly interesting to say about it, but in terms of the question of the Syrian refugee crisis in Europe, right, the issue of hospitality in the in the Islamic Christian <laughs> conjunction is 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 I mean very it's incredibly timely, yeah. uh, and, and the debates about like you know who is going to take what and what is the responsibility that the Islamic world has to uh, to these refugees versus that of uh, the European world that the question of hospitality is 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 absolutely foregrounded. And also the, the threat 
of the guest, right? Mm -hmm. The extent to which yeah. the is, guest is a threat. Yeah. 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 This is, a, there's a kind of, um, as you all are talking this out, there's a kind of, I got, I, I entered in on the question of hospitality in a little bit of an uncomfortable way, but I'm recognizing, I think, here the kind of gains of it, which is that with hospitality, it seems like there's a, that notion of threat, or we're always indebted to enter into relations of hospitality. So that kind of primordial indebtedness made me a little nervous at first, because this is, and it's not just Derrida, I mean, there's, I think this version of this, you could say, in Sartre, uh, even in Benjamin, um, the idea that we're kind of born guilty before certain codes or laws or whatever they might be. And so, you know, in 2015, <laughs> something that, I don't know, I'm a little weirded out by that. That's, that's as intelligent a thing as I can say. But, I mean, in, in a way, what you get, if you, if you embrace that, I'm, I'm coming around to it here because it seems like, you know, we are, if you want to use a Heideggerian notion of thrownness, or I think Levinas, you know, has us exposed to one another by virtue of the face, just primordially, we're thrown into these relations of interactions with others. And what is a government without hospitality like in the Syrian situation, or let's say in the U.S. in the case of quote-unquote illegal immigration or whatnot, um, a government with hospitality might be a government without ethics by this definition. And ethics, the, the work of hospitality is a very hard ethics. It's embracing that threat uh, or recognizing our sense of um, thrownness into relations where we're guilty by virtue of kind of how we enter into them. I don't know if that makes sense, but... Well, this is where the temporality question is interesting. Yeah. You know, um, there is a way that hospitality temporalizes the relationship to otherness in a way that I actually think, um, you know, if you, it, that I actually think when you read Derrida very carefully, um, he's using like this actual relatable. Um, and then, like very relatable, right? Especially hospitality, like just the just the the very simple thing of like having someone over always can produce a little bit of anxiety, right? Like, so there's this experiential way that it that it temporalizes insofar as you don't notice it until like someone is coming, and so it, it kind of makes it seem like it's there's an afterness or there's a yeah. there's a there's a, a future. Um, that is somehow separate from the present, but I actually think that what's most important about this work is that it shows that it's it's a future that is infiltrating and disrupting the present, and so I think that that's crucial to to what Derridian ethics is. Although I do notice that when it gets thematized in these ways, it does seem to temporalize in a more stretched out way than I think is crucial um, to the Derridian project. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I think that makes total that makes total sense, and in the sense of like, and I'm no expert, but um, and we don't have to stick with this example, but with the Syrian refugee crisis, I mean, I think it's I think the numbers are something like on average, if you achieve refugee status, you're going to stay that way for at least about 15 years, on average. So the sort of future that never comes, but also is always already arriving. Uh, how long do you have to host somebody? And in a sense, um, the interesting way in which Derrida works here is, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Bert, but, but there's a parallax where you host them, but they host you too, mm -hmm. um, in yeah. a sense. They're, they're judging you, uh, and you have responsibility to them and vice versa. And so it, it's interesting. I like what you say a lot. Um, I think it's provocative, the way in which it screws up temporality. Mm -hmm. um, we're there's always an eternal sense of hospitality and an immediate ethical, political negotiation, but always a sense of futurity that's always already here but never fully arrives. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and the thing that, that strikes me about it is the violence, uh, I mean, to return to a, a previous discussion, the violence of, like, the invitation, the, the distinction he makes early on between, like, the invitation and the, and the visitation, right? That the... Yeah. The, the, the violence of inviting somebody, right, insofar as it's saying it's claiming a home. Yeah. 
right? I mean, and you don't, you just don't think about that. You say, oh well, in, an invitation isn't that the opening up? And it's like, yes, it's an opening up, but only by establishing a closedness that is your proper space that you are authorized to bring someone else into, right? And that that in order for it to be thought radically, uh, hospitality has to not have an invite, has to not be invited. <laughs> right, it has to be capable of being not prepared, right, uh, for for whatever whatever is to come, and and this to me is the direct connection to the forgiveness uh, uh, question. So you know, one of the and obviously the logic of the gift that that plays out for him uh, here, but in in other places where it is the nature of the gift that if you if someone knows you're giving them a gift, you've no longer given them a gift. You have entered into an economic exchange, right? You have placed them in some capacity at some level into a kind of debt. So yep. which is to say, in order to forgive, you can't say the words, I forgive. I think there's, there's, this, there's one passage where he says, there's really nothing more haughty than saying the words, he does. I forgive you. Because, because one is, of course, thereby assuming the position of one who can give forgiveness. And so that's where he gets into that motif of you first of all have to ask forgiveness of the one that you're forgiving for having assumed a position in order to forgive them, you know. Yeah. I thought I think that's actually a really elegant passage because it's it's striking and it totally subverts the way one normally thinks about forgiveness as an act of Christian charity. Right. right. And it's also elegant in the sense of it it totally synthesizes with the idea of uh, the reciprocality of hospitality. I mean, they're kind of one and the same there. It's really nice moment, I gotta say. So there is. This is on 398. But on the one hand, when so this isn't the haughty question, I don't think. But on the one hand, when someone forgives someone else, uh, well, then one must above all not tell the latter. The other must not hear, must not say that one forgives, not only in order to recall the fault, right? In other words, like forgiving you is also recalling the fault that you did something wrong. Yeah. Um, but not only not to recall the fault, but also not to recall or to manifest that something was given, that something was given back again that then deserves gratitude or risks obligating the one who is forgiven. At bottom, nothing is more vulgar and impolite, even wounding, than to obligate someone by telling them, I forgive you which implies an I give you and already opens a scene of acknowledgement and a transaction of gratitude, a commerce of thanking that destroys the gift. I mean, that's, to me, yeah, I mean, in terms of calling attention to the, to the, the violent and appropriative dynamics of, again, what Christian charity or, or, or generosity that we, we, we think of as just being the sort of openness thing, it's like actually there is a, a, there's a, a, a deep-seated violence. But then, of course, at the bottom of that page, but on the other hand, and inversely, what would a silent forgiveness be? An unperceived forgiveness, an unknown forgiveness granted unbeknownst to the one receiving it. Would it be forgiveness at all, right? I mean, and, and continuing that motif, and this is, this is where, to me, like, again, the, impossible, the, the, the conditions of possibility are simultaneously the conditions of impossibility. But if nothing else, if nothing else, and I don't think there's nothing else, it gives one to think of... <laughs> The, the 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 stakes uh, the the stakes of entering into economic exchanges when you thought you were just inviting someone over to your house. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. There's um, no, it's very nice. Boy, I'd love to see in the French what well gratitude and vulgar. Um, that's really interesting. There's I'm I'm almost tempted to say in this paragraph, but in other places, I mean this general dynamic you're pointing to. There's almost an element, it seems to me, of Heidegger's, um, what is the language he used? Distaste for the crowd, or Kierkegaard for the they or the them, and idle chatter and so forth. And so that forgiveness cannot just be something that the crowd does instinctively or ritually. It, it can't be consummated, um, it, which is a really powerful argument. It can't be just the um, reflexive use of the language. Although that reflexive language is the site of the, the deeper intervention here. So, yeah, I think that's really um, evocative. Well, there's, there's, there's a passage that I wanted to look at because I want you guys to help with it a little bit because I think it's really, um, 
I think it's on 362. This is back on hospitality shortly yeah. after the visitation uh, um, versus invitation distinction. Mm -hmm. These next few pages for me are the sort of upshot of a lot of the hospitality st stuff. Um, and it's 362. Well, I mean, w walking through the argument a little bit on 361, this is where, so, so the invitation versus the visitation, this is, we said it a moment ago, but one, on the one hand, one has to be ready to, to, uh, to accept the other, to be hospitable, one has to be prepared. But on the other hand, if one is prepared, then you're not welcoming the other as other. You are simply playing playing out a script. So you also simultaneously have to not be prepared and, and not be ready. So one must not be ready nor prepared to welcome or disposed to welcome. For if the welcome is a simple manifestation of a natural or acquired dis disposition of a generous character, character or hospitable habitus, there's no merit in it. No welcome of the other uh, as other, right? Such that, and then moving down on the 362, where he's now hooked this into the relationship of concepts, and this to me is the, uh, uh, um, the fantastic sentence, each concept becomes hospitable to its other, to an other than itself that is no longer its other, right? And it's that twist at the end, which is to say an other that is not its other, an other that is not already recognized in advance as being mine, like mm -hmm. and the, the for me, that he says, with this apparent nuance, we have a formula of the entire contradiction, which is more than a dialectical contradiction, and which constitutes perhaps the very stakes of all consistent deconstructions. The difference between something like its other, the Hegelian formula, mm -hmm. the difference, therefore, between hospitality extended to one's other, to everybody their own, they're chosen, they're selected, put, uh, you know, guest host, uh, um, they're integratable immigrants, they're assimilable visitors, and hospitality extended to an other who no longer is, who never was the its other of dialectics. And so, and that's just to me a really, really tight way of uh, two things. One is of connecting to the things that Brooke is saying about the, the distinction between the absolute hospitality and the, and the conditional rights hospitality, because the conditional rights are all about its other. Who are the others that we'll, we will accept as immigrants, right? Um, who are the others which will be allowed? How many of them and for how long? Uh, or who do I invite to dinner? And all of those kind of conditionings. Um, but, but what he's interested in in terms of the absolute is not its other. It's precisely an otherness that is not pre-organized in advance for me. For him, what's, what I think ends up being really cool here is mm -hmm. that that's the distinction between Hegelian dialectics and deconstruction, mm -hmm. which is you have a non-dialectizable relationship between the self and other because that other is not its other. It's not the other of the self, right? So that they're not, uh, in some ways, they're not despite Levinas's terminology, two faces facing one another. Although, to be fair, you know, Levinas's face-to-face -face is one transcendent. There's not, you know, it's not like they're like sort of equal participants at all, right? Um, so I was just wondering what you guys thought about that. Because actually, and this is another thing, because I, I took one of the uh, uh, long-term trajectories of this piece to be about... Uh, including animals and other living things in the problematic of yeah. Levinasian alterity, from which Levinas distinguishes them. And it occurs to me that it's precisely this notion of its other that, that territorializes on the human, mm -hmm. right? That when the other is thought of as my other, right, uh, then, then the human becomes the kind of paradigmatic image, whereas in disconnecting that, and that's what Levinas is attempting to do, right, is to disconnect that, that one should, of necessity, and this is where the, the last essay or the last lecture ends up, is that we can no longer talk about this substitution only in terms of a substitution of people and intersubject or interhuman relations. It has to be life itself. So that was a lot of shit out there. That was my... <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Yeah, well, I noticed, I mean, just to, to pick up on, um, I mean, so now the, the question of the animal seems so um, important in rhetoric studies, you know, to see it here, even in this um, not recent essay, it's like, it, it's, it's so clear, right? It's so 
um, clearly related to the larger project of deconstruction, which is um, which is a kind of otherness beyond, you know, a relation to an other that that you cannot know, that you cannot can never master, that that doesn't belong to you, that you know that that puts into question the very thing we we like to think of as human, um, in, in its specialness and singularity, right? And, and so that's that's part of the substitution argument that um, you know the experience of singularity is the kind of uh, I'm, I'm searching for the right word. The within that experience of singularity, utterly substitutable, right? You know, that's what that's what it is. Interrupted itself, the singularity itself, interrupted, not um, not kind of special or unique or irreplaceable, but irreplaceable in in the way that it is utterly replaceable all the time, in, the, in that kind of ongoing way. And I found myself in this, in the context of this being more sympathetic to Levinas than I have in the past, which is uh, to say, you know, uh, no, you're still there. Here? Yeah, I hear you. Froze for a second. You just had an interruption in service. You guys, you guys both froze and opposed, and I was like, I don't think they're holding those poses. <laughs> <laughs> um. So uh, what I was going to say is, like, I sort of am, am buying more than I have before. If one starts from the point of Dasein, right, which is a being that has a, con a caring, concerned relationship to its being, um, that, that you can't be in the world in the way that uh, Levinas wants you to be in the world, that, that in fact it makes sense to me more than it ever has why he would want to take issue and, and insist on ethics as first philosophy, which is to say that the, the being who cares for its life is, is already a kind of secondary phenomenon. But again, the really hard thing is that what do we mean by calling it secondary? Does it come temporally after? Is there one thing first, the other thing later? That's what I think Derrida is really good on. And even the next page, right, where he says, you know, for, for Levinas, for instance, you have an ethical relation when it's just me and the other. And then it's the entry of the third, which introduces the political. Mm -hmm. That would seem to imp that wouldn't seem to imply. It says the first thing is an ethical relation. The second thing is uh, is a political relation. And then Derrida wants to say, you know, <clears throat> in the middle of 364, there we've undergone such a test or ordeal a thousand times. When, for example, to remain close to Levinas a little longer, we saw that the border between the ethical and the political is no longer ensured that the third, who is the birth of justice and finally of the state, already announces himself in the duel of the face-to-face -face and the face, which is to say there isn't an ethical moment to be supplemented by a, a, a political moment. Mm -hmm. And it's exactly thinking where we want to say these aren't the same moments, but, but they're not simply different either, which is it's not its other. It's, it's a, a, an absolute visitation. Um, and, and at least to me, this is where the logic of spectrality uh, that, that both of you guys work with in your chapters becomes really, really important. And as you know, to me, I was like wondering if you could talk through how you see the spectrality coming into play there. Um, let me, yeah, no, I can. Um, let me first kind of note the sort of to tie back, if I can, with where we were earlier with deconstruction. I mean, it's striking in the middle of this page. I had. Um, all kind of crazy star to underline where he talks a little bit above that on 364 about deconstruction. deconstruction. Essentially, hospitality is the deconstruction of the at home, and deconstruction is hospitality to the other. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that really resonates, John, with what you were saying about this is a, a contrast with Hegelian dialectics. If deconstruction is always about, in some sense, reintroducing otherness, being hospitable to otherness, which is also a site of struggle. Um, in that way, and um, and that we get to the idea that that the beyond of the state has to be produced inside the state itself, and so forth. Um, and and uh, the idea that you're kind of you're not going around in a circle; you're always working backward to work forward. It's very weird in some sense, but as uh, from a rhetorical perspective, the really cool thing I love his moments where in both sections you've read where the the concept has an other of itself. Like we're no longer even talking about, apropos of what you were saying with your gesture to animals, 
but even other forms of alterity. We're not we're talking about what language and concepts one and the same are doing in and of themselves as they create friction or harmony with one another. And I, I never know how we get there, but we get there in such a nice way. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> like we don't have to make arguments like, oh we're not going to talk about intent anymore or effect. But we're still talking about intent and effect. Just us as wetware has dropped out of it, and we get to the really good stuff. So. <laughs> anyway, sorry. But yeah, I think I think in terms of spectrality, it'd be interesting. I'll just throw out there, and uh, maybe Brooke has thoughts on this because hers, I think, probably on the relationship are more developed. I mean, in 362 is also one of the places where we get a full-throated introduction of the Messiah. And it seems to me here that there are many names for spectrality. It would be interesting to talk about what those names do. And so the Messiah as one iteration of that, the stranger, the Arivant, and so forth, the visitor, um, to the extent that I wonder, Brooke, if these are different names for spectrality or if spectrality has to be something more singular and reserved and disruptive. Well, I don't know. This, I think, is that question of, um, I mean, I pose the question of the relationship between the two as an actual question because, again, I mean, the structure is, of course, similar. Um, but what's nice about, I mean, in, in relationship to the, the conversation we pointed to at the beginning here, there is this kind of, when it's so um, deeply exploring these religious thinkers, you know, with which I'm not familiar, um, so there's a way that the, the kind of commitment to the religious um, theme is a little alienating to me, um, mm -hmm. that the spectral theme is not, right? Like the, spec the spectral theme, you know, doesn't hang, you know, um, there is like, there, there's a messianism there, but it's not so um, explicitly tied to, to religion. Um, so that's to say, I mean, I don't know. Maybe what that means is that, that you cannot untie the two. Maybe that means that any thinking of um, the specter, the Arivant, is also a thinking of, um, you know, God, right? Although, of course, he would want a divorce. He would, want, he would not want that to be a kind of content-based understanding. And yet... Right, it's like he still uses the Messiah as as the structure for thinking it. And these are some of the questions that you that you all posed before our discussion. Like, to what extent is the structure of a question of hospitality tied to the religious tradition? And I, I think I want to say it's it's not tied, right? It's not indebted um, in any essential way, right? Yeah. And, yeah. Yet, and yet, right? and yet, we're all good secularists. Yeah. That's our problem. Because I feel the same way. I, I really loved the way that that you phrased it, Brad, in the in the exchange that we had beforehand, where you said, um, "For lack of a less half baked thought, <laughs> this is not yeah. big thought. The 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 tying of ethics to certain version of Judeo Christian theology is beginning to feel claustrophobic." Right, and and I I like that uh, 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 that way of thinking. Now, obviously, one of the things that Derrida is trying to do here is introduce an Islamic uh, uh, dimension uh, to, to to hospitality. Um, but nevertheless, it's quite clear that by and large, right, like that that, that it's almost as if these the questions of alterity um, require. A, a religious, a religious history, at least, or they are built on the ground of of these relations. And yeah, I mean, for instance, I feel like Levinas in the essay that in the exchange we read has some interesting things to say about God. Like God is not a unity. God is not a gathering into into oneness. And it is precisely dispersion and encounter with absolute alterity. So I mean, I think that that those are interesting things. But but like Brooke, I don't. I just don't. I'm not a so invested in them, and uh, and I, I wonder if the language, well, does the language, what does the language cost and what does it buy to work it through uh, um, questions of re explicit religion? I don't know. Well, it's, it's interesting to ask to what extent for both Levinas and Derrida does um, God, or excuse me, spectrality, if we want to inject that term, or to the extent that's already present, 
does spectrality have to have a supernatural content? Right. Um, is God the sort of ultimate specter? And just speaking about the sort of chapter, my own, the interest in spectra spectrality or haunting there is the idea. For me, one of the things I remember being interested in the way in which, you know, with certain forms of contemporary or modern media, how specters are manufactured. They're, they're everywhere. The god is in the machine, in the, in the machinery of photography, in a sense. And so that we're kind of confronted with manufactured otherness, and we can't get behind the uh, surface to the real, full-dimensional subjects. Um, so we're always haunted in that sense. The, the haunting is, is flat, but more kind of disturbing for all that, and it forces rethinking of certain ethical and political relationships to that surface, if not those actual subjects. And so it's, it's interesting to go back and read the movement from Levinas to Derrida here, because it almost seems like I'd love to, um, I'd love to think more about this, because obviously with, with Levinas, that he talks about this in the uh, in the uh, interview that okay so God's not necessarily you know God in the biggest supernatural biblical sense but there's still this primordial prospect of God that human that is in in here's in between humans I'm not going to say humans created or it kind of arrives from elsewhere but it's there it's fundamentally primarily always there and it Seems to me. Although it's not there, I mean, just to just, it's also not present. So it's not. No, it's not present. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It has inherency or what, whatever. It's it's it, it's there. Um, no, I like that coda. But you know, for Derrida, it seems uh, I'm always, I never know in here if he's accepting that as an operating premise, or if I'm more tempted to say that's just an effect of the textual tradition. Um, it's it's overweening, it's always there, it's omnipresent and profound and so forth, so we have to start with grand declarations about God and the Messiah as the kind of um, beginning and end of the whole story, but, uh, but at the same time, I never can tell if for him it's merely textual. I want to say it would be consistent for him to say so, but man, sometimes it, it, it feels like something's there, if not present, you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, the way Levinas tells the story, uh, you know, is that you have a uh, basically Judeo-Christian tradition that starts about the same time as a Greek tradition, um, but the only way that we have access to the Judeo-Christian tradition is through its Greek sort of philosophical incarnation, and what the Greek brings to the table is, is, is truth as presence. That's right. Um, so, so all subsequent thinking of gods, we're thinking of an entity, thinking of a, you know, um, whereas... Yeah, you're right. Yeah. That there is some sort of there's other ways of thinking uh, a God as something other than a thing that would be present, um, but as a kind of relation of absolute exposure and vulnerability, right? That that's that's what we're talking about when we talk about God. So and it's easy to say, oh well, God that means God is the entity of vulnerabilities. No, no, no. God's at least if you follow this out, God God's not an entity, um, and so. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I actually think that for Derrida, it, it's, you know, difference is a kind of, um, it's the case, right? <laughs> for him, I mean, he'll say that. It's like, it's not, it's not an argument. I'm not making an argument. This is just, this is what happened. This is, you know, ontology in quotation marks, because I'm not taking sides in the ethics versus ontology version of that. Mm -hmm. um, but, but it's the case, so it's it's not. I mean, I would say it's as primordial for Derrida as it is for Levinas. It's just that Difference is not necessarily religious. In it's the a sense of primordiality. Right, in the sense of coming through one of those, you know, three revealed religions or or, or whatever. Um, yeah. Not that it doesn't circulate very powerfully there, um, but but I think that at least for me, that's one of the things that one can take from Derrida is working notions of iteration and so I, I'm uncomfortable with Levinas's discourse first of all because he retains the word the other uh, but second of all because it is seems so clearly linked to a theology that I'm just not I, I'm kind of allergic to for better or for worse and Derrida allows me to think that by and large without having to go through 
the religious element, which is why these interviews are sort of like, oh, well, this is not the Derrida that I want to talk about. <laughs> yeah, right. well, I mean, that, that question with Derrida has been, you know, an important one, the question of was, an, was it in fact an ethical turn around the time of Spectres and Marx, and, and Derrida, of course, says no, um, that he says, Brad, what you said, that, that this is difference, like, I've been interested in this, um, from any discussion of difference is, is the, it has always had this attention to um, the interruption of presence by, by, by otherness or the impossible. And I mean, I think that, I mean, yeah, I, I absolutely, that's my sense of it in reading some of the later things. But yeah, this, this particular text that is so, um, you know, so carefully reading religious tradition, um, yeah, it doesn't doesn't speak to that as clearly when you read this one alone. And the and the the book that, if I read the note of this chapter correctly, so this follows these lectures follow the of hospitality lectures. I, I think that's what I read in the note of the the translator's note of the um, chapter. So it's like yeah, and and the the book is not quite as explicitly religious as this. You know, the the essays in that in that slim book. Um, so, you know, take take all of them together. That you don't see that as clearly. I don't think the the commitment to the the careful attention to um, the the monotheistic religions. You know. But it also, I mean, to me, more than it, it speaks to what you said earlier, Brooke, which is that, like, okay, he's with the discourses that he's working with. The question of the messianic is is there, and so I'm I'm going to work this sort of I'm working this thinking again. It's that sounds way too active subject. I'm going to work this thinking, but yeah. this thinking is always in relationship to wherever it is, and so uh, if if the language of hospitality in the case of the folks that he's interested in intersects with uh, questions of, of spirituality, then that's where you go right I mean and that's um, so there is a sense in which it's it's also I guess nice that he doesn't avoid uh, uh, religion in ways that I do um, because I can't I have a hard time thinking productively and, and uh, with it so yeah no I think I think that's right and I mean um, <laughs> the answer to my question is, sounds like could be as simple as John's favorite sentence in the Difference essay, God, for example. <laughs> so, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, and, and so I, I totally follow that. And the thing to praise Derrida is about is, is I mean, he'll use anything he can use. Um, and so that that monotheistic tradition, because the interesting thing about ethics, I would think, particularly as it's enacted in language, is if, to be, if there's a disciplining function that comes from this. The interesting thing about ethics, I would think, particularly as it's enacted in language, is if to be, if there's a disciplining function that comes from that Judeo-Christian tradition, that you're only going to get a certain kind of ethics out of it, even if, if you're getting a Derridian reading right. of that ethics, or a Derridian production of an ethics that is attendant upon that tradition. Whereas, you know, if, if particularly some of the animal stuff or the alterity or uh, Thomas's work, um, the different resources, different sites of ethical interaction might produce a very different kind of ethical idiom. I don't know. That's a really open question, but you know. well, I think that's right, and I, I mean, I think that your question was good. It, it, that's where I, the term claustrophobic that it adequately characterizes. You know, there there are other idea, and the, the the fact that it seems to so. For instance, this is exactly why people don't read of grammatology as being a book of ethics. Mm -hmm. This is exactly why people read Derrida, as Brooke just pointed out. The so-called ethical turn is when he starts talking about religion, and it's like, no, in fact, and so Simon Critchley makes this argument quite well. You know, is that the, all of the thinking was always an ethical thinking; it simply wasn't the religious thinking. You know. Yeah. 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 And and you know, as we've discussed, even in here, you don't get you don't get to keep the the, the religious foundation right as a reason for hospitality or any no. reason for forgiveness. So, but still, yes, yeah. No. But I do think. I mean, to me, that's what is exciting about 
Daryl's work and why I don't, and, and maybe it's just, maybe this is coming, you know, I, I haven't tired of, of reading it because I do feel like, and, and I like work that does this, that lets itself, you know, be at risk in a certain way, right, that lets itself be, you know, changed by, overtaken by the thing that it's with, right, the thing that it that, that it's with and um, and so despite the fact that you can see the, the possibility, the impossibility um, across different locations, you know, it's never, um, yeah, I don't know, I, I, the interaction is elegant enough for me, even though that structure is always there, that it's... I think, uh, like, Levinas says, it, Levinas says it really great. There's a moment in the interview where he says, uh, he's distinguishing between philosophy and science, and he says, you know, philosophy is, um, uh, uh, allows, it, uh, allows itself to question itself and even unsay itself. And yeah. it is that capacity to unsay itself that he sees as precisely the primordial uh, ethical exposure. And now, I, I would... I don't care about the word philosophy, let's just bracket that out, but that there is a thinking uh, uh, that, that one uh, touches on in Derrida, which is an attempt to question and unsay itself, mm -hmm. uh, and, and to render that sort of, I, I don't like the word primordial because it feels, Levinas would probably be a little more comfortable with it than Derrida would, that, you know, that, that so-called primordial experience is already uh, um, uh, tainted with the politics, and it has to, and it has to be. Um, but nevertheless. No, I, I think what you say is right, Rogan. And it, I'm almost, to come back to one more pass at the notion of spectrality, it'd be interesting to read what he's doing, for example, in Spectres of Marx, or here, that the monotheistic tradition, just as it is in, with Marx, in Spectres, is, is you, you can't get around being haunted by these things. Right. Um, and so that this is not just sort of a resource or a starting point or um, a site of interpretation, but he's inhabiting, um, and I'm making a reference to Cinders, which is a work I like a lot, so I'm just going to shove it in, but you know, he's, he's dealing with ashes here, in a way, yeah. with ghosts. Yeah. Uh, and that um, to, to think about doing the work of hospitality and forgiveness and love in the here and now, you're going to have to go into the, the, the spectral realm of where that practice comes from, like it or not. So just as he did with the work of um, politics in its style in Spectres of Marx. Mm -hmm. so. That the monotheism is the, is the specter here. Would be an interesting. Right. I yeah. don't know. Yeah. And of course, you don't don't get to see his face. So, <laughs> oh, yeah. speaking of seeing faces, this is a seamless segue. Um, <laughs> it's we've been over an hour now, and I wanted to keep it uh, reasonable so you guys uh, didn't tax your time. But thank, I want to thank both of you guys for obviously your generosity. Uh, this is to me. This is fun. Like this is what I yeah. wanted to do. It's just like chat with you guys about some stuff that I'm that I'm reading. So. Yeah, no, thanks for, for uh, you know, um, thanks so much. This is awesome. I feel lucky to have been part of it. I, unfortunately, I invited you. So. <laughs> no, I really appreciate it. I wish we could go for a couple more hours. That would be fun. So. Yeah. Totally. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, call us if we need to do some retakes. That, that, sound, that sounds great, guys. Thanks again. Thanks so much, and I'll talk to you both really soon. Okay. Right. See you. Take care. Bye.